So welcome everybody. Um, today is uh, April 7th, Tuesday. Uh, it's a beautiful day out if you haven't had a chance to get out yet. And today we're gonna talk about security and passwords. Um, I've been working on going through each step of the way, every single tool that we've been using little by little uh, uh, to reference all the old shows and all the old tools that we've been using. If you go to rsu19.info, You'll see them all listed right there. Um, and so if you well, want to go back and jump to one, if you are sorry, if you know somebody that this would benefit and they haven't watched any of these yet, um, what I would start was actually the one yesterday called the Distance uh, Learning Toolkit. And the idea is that that right here would have the links to all these other ones so that if somebody wants to know where do I start, there's so much to go on, it works them through from bottom all the way up to top. Um, so that if we're starting from scratch, you know, first you have to make sure you're comfortable with your account, and then you have to make sure you're comfortable with some of the tools, you know, one by one. So that's where I'd start them. Uh, and then from there, uh, where today we're going to dive into uh, a really important question that is not super fun to talk about as far as it's not as, as interesting as some of the other tools, but it's security and passwords. Um, as we have become more and more reliant on what we're using every day, we're using these, you know, digital technologies, it's more crucial than ever uh, that we as a group, as an educational group, uh, make sure that we're being really mindful about what we're doing with our accounts. And so it's kind of one of those things I know sometimes people will say like, oh, it's, it's no big deal. It's just my account. I don't have anything to hide. Uh, so, you know, I'm not worried about anybody stealing anything because I don't have anything interesting. And that may be true, but the reality is we're all in this together. So your account is connected to all of our accounts in the sense that we're all in a domain. Um, and if somebody was able to get into your account because you were careless with your password or you weren't really worried about it, letting somebody in, you know, your password was one, two, three, four, um, people would be able to dive in and break in. Uh, and why, what would be the problem with that? Well, they're able to access everything that you have access to. So if you're a teacher, if you're an educator, um, it's just the same thing as you wouldn't leave uh, your educational records out on the street and let people kind of rifle through them. Um, you have the same responsibility here. You have to make sure that you are keeping track of your passwords and your accounts and you're not getting um, you know, taken advantage of or, or spammed. Um, we purposely in the district, tech department, we do everything we can from our end to, to mitigate that, uh, to make it be as, as, as easy as possible, but nothing's perfect. you know. So we really will want your help in that. Um, so we'll start by going through some of the kind of the, the tips and tricks. Um, I also wanna bring up uh, questions from last couple of days. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we, we started with uh, a show, the Digital Learning uh, Toolkit, the Distance Learning Toolkit, the idea being that if you have other people you want to share and you just want to show one video, I would start with that one because that will cover a lot of ground. It doesn't go into a deep dive with any individual pieces. Um, it just does it so that it kind of gives you an overview. And then from there, you can go into a deeper dive if you want. So another question that came up yesterday um, um, from Brian, I believe, was about having students join this PD session right now, join this. And I think that'd be awesome. They are more than welcome. Uh, if there's any students that you want to join, for example, tomorrow we're going to talk about um, WeVideo as an editing platform for videos. So if that's something that you think would be beneficial for your students, absolutely, they're welcome to join us live. Or if you want them to watch it later, that's absolutely fine too. Um, and we'll keep going forward. I, I am having some students in our broadcasting program start to work on recording little little snippets, a little how-tos, so some of these pieces. If you don't need a whole video, an hour-long video on, on a topic, maybe you just need a little uh, directional one, we're starting to build that library and work on that so that we can you know, basically just directly uh, hand those out. Um, all right, so absolutely welcome to have students to join if they want to. That also brings us to another question. Uh, we were asked by, um, a, a, there's some of the sources out there, some of the tools that are out there, uh, and, you, and you might be asking, why aren't we using those? Two big ones that come up. One is Facebook. Uh, for example, and another one is Zoom. Uh, and so these are very popular tools right now. They make a lot of sense for the public sphere in the sense that mom and dads are using them and um, you know, and you might hear other businesses or other people are using them. So a couple things with that. First up, we'll take Facebook. Uh, Facebook is a great platform as far as connecting with everybody. Most people have Facebook accounts. The reason why we're not advocating for Facebook as a place to communicate, now it's one thing to publish. So if I'm doing a one-way communication, I'm putting out a website, people can look at that, they can see things, but we're not interacting back and forth, and I'm not requiring other people to have accounts there, uh, that's one thing. And so uh, publishing to Facebook makes sense to me, no big deal, like it's a one-way street. The issue comes is uh, if you want to use Facebook as a tool to communicate back and forth with kids, there's no management. Now we say, well, who cares? I don't care if there's management or not. 
if anything in the communication that has an educational uh, focus to it, we are required by FERPA for that becomes an educational record. So we have to keep track of that. And so if you had a Facebook account and you had Facebook uh, message going back and forth with a student or a parent, and there's no record of that, they can say, well, there's a record of it. Where do we want to see that? And there's nothing in Facebook that I know of. There's no record. Now, maybe someday they will add that as an ability. But right now, there's no management option. Um, it's basically a personal account. The other factor there is if you have a student, you know, create their own personal account on Facebook and they message another student and they kind of go back and forth and who knows what they're saying, we are not advocating for them to have those accounts. That's really between the parents. Um, so the parents would have to would, would address that just like you would at home, not through the school. We don't become the middleman for that conversation. Um, things that are done inside of our, with our accounts, with our school Google domain, if a student messages somebody or emails somebody or shares a Google Doc, everything is tr is kept, the store. So even if they delete it, we still have access to it. Um, and that's, you know, legally, that's important. And so uh, these are some reasons why, yes, they're you know great tools and a lot of people are using them, but we can't make an official line to require our students or our parents to have Facebook accounts for them to join. If we do that, we're just it's it's there's headaches later on. Uh, the other one is Zoom. Now Zoom again is another cool tool. Um, Zoom can be set up to be just as secure as Hangouts. We focus on Hangouts in our district mostly because the students already have accounts. They already have what they need to join. Um, there's some little tweaks that we're, we're still working on as far as making it as seamless as possible, but there's not another layer of, of, of you know, issues there, another technology layer on top of that. Um, also, I'm sure you guys have seen in the news or heard in the news there's some issues with security and blah, blah, blah. They're getting better. Um, they went from, as a, as a tool, they went from like 10 million users to like 200 million users in, in a week or two weeks. So that's a crazy amount of eyeballs that are now using this tool and looking at what's going on. Um, and so one of the things right now is the amount of steps it takes to set up a Zoom call so that it can't be, um, so it's totally secure, meaning they only allow people in and people can't come outside and so forth. Um, it's, it's pretty, there's a number of steps. It can be done. Uh, but there's a handful of steps that have to be done every time. And so right now, if I invite you guys, right now I'm, I've invited the district into this uh, hangout. That means that you have to have an rsu19.net account to get in. If you are outside the district, I personally can allow or, or ignore people coming in. So I have that that ability to do that. Now, you do have that in the Zoom as well, um, but if you don't have somebody that's really keeping on top of that and tracking that stuff, you could have people join that you weren't intending to, and who knows what they could put on there. So it's not that it can't be set up to be secure, it's that there are a number more steps that you have to go through, and if you miss one or forget one or whatever, you could have something inappropriate pop up. And that's really what's happened if you look around. Um, people weren't setting it up perfectly right every time, and then they would have some people, and as people are kind of trapped inside, some people are nefarious, are kind of you know, as a, as a, for the, for the lulls, for the joke to kind of go see if they can crash zoom bomb or crash another zoom going on and kind of do inappropriate things in there. So we want to make sure it's as secure as possible for our students. Um, even if the, you know, the ease of use isn't as much as, as some of the other tools that we've seen out there, there are rationale and reasons behind that. So great questions. Uh, and if you have any questions if, after today, or if you want to ask us more, if you go to rsu19.info, scroll down, you'll see the attendance, which make sure you do that as well. Uh, submit your attendance. And also on the right side, you'll see where you can put in and ask questions and comments, and we'll address them each day as much as we can. Sweet. All right. So the other thing we're going to do today is password and security related. Uh, as I mentioned, this is not something that when we talk about security, it's not just for yourself. When you're using a school account, it's not just the fact like, well, I don't care about my own account. You know, nobody's going to hack that or I don't care about that, whatever. The reality is if a student or if a, a somebody else got into your account, they have the same privileges that you do. And that's the reason why we have a password. That's the reason why that's so important. Um, I have seen and spoken to uh, educators in our district who have their password on a sticky note on their laptop. They're like, oh, I don't care. I don't care about that stuff. You may not. But if you don't care about it, you are basically opening up every other educator and all the students in the district uh, to that. It's like the best way to think about it is if you're, we're all in a submarine and everybody's got their finger in a hole uh, that, that's, uh, that's blocking the water from coming in. And all of a sudden somebody says, well, I don't care about mine. They pull those out. Yeah, that may not care about your own, but it's affecting everybody else and everyone's going to pay for it. So you want to make sure that your security, your password, your login, um, just like everything else, is 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 secure. If you're not sure, you know, absolutely, you know, email us at any time, um, and I'm going to go through some of the ways you can make sure that's as good as it can be. Um, so let me do a quick screen share here.
Okay, so you should be able to see. There we go. Um, okay, so uh, the first thing I'm gonna do to set up a password. Now, you, I'm sure you've heard of or seen some of these um, messages around, like you know, make sure you have a letter and a number and all this kind of stuff. Um, so there is a website called How Secure Is My Password, um, and I usually have my students when we start talking about passwords. Um, I have them come here and say, enter a password. So we start with a, a dictionary word. Well, what's a dictionary word? It's just a word that you can find in the dictionary. Um, so if I type in uh, monkey as my password, um, it would be cracked instantaneously. And the reason why is it's not a case where people are hacking in like we think of in the movies. In the movies, you see some guy you know, with a long, scraggly beard in a closet somewhere, and he's got green letters and numbers flying through the screen, and he's typing away furiously and he's hacking into the, the system. Uh, that's not what's going on most often. What typically happens is what's called social engineering. And what that means is that somebody convinces you or a website convinces you to give you a password away. And again, you might say, well, I would never do that. Why would I do that? Uh, it happens to the best of us, people that you wouldn't think. Um, for example, last year or two years ago or whatever it was when the, the DNC got hacked, uh, the reason why they got hacked, the reason why the, the Democratic National Convention's uh, database of all their donors and all that information got hacked was somebody, um, one of their higher ups, gave somebody their password because it looked like it was asking to reset their password. It looked like there was a, a situation where a IT person said, hey, send us your password. We need to reset this thing. And it looked like it. And so they just sent it in and then the entire thing came down. So. We will never ask you to send us, the tech department, or, or like your bank or any of these things, will ask you to send us your password outright because we wouldn't need it. If we needed to get into your account um, from a tech department, it was possible to do that without asking for your password. Um, and also, you want to make sure it's something that's you know written down somewhere uh, that no one else has. If you have to write it down, it's not somewhere that you're going to put it you know, taped to your laptop, like I said, as I've seen. So any dictionary word right here, these can be instantaneously. And the reason why is because it takes no time at all for a computer program to copy and paste everywhere in the dictionary to try their account. Um, if I start saying, so I said monkeys, let's say I do a capital M and I'll throw a one in there and I'll throw a zero um, and we'll do an N, uh, K, uh, uh, another number three, um, Y, an exclamation point, all that kind of stuff. You notice it's still, uh, it's only seven minutes. So if I start getting added all kinds of different crazy letters here, um, and this is what the kids like to do. They just like to throw a bunch of letters and numbers on here. So it would take forever to crack that password. That's great. But the reality is I have no idea what that password is. I could never remember that. So a couple tips, a couple ways to deal with that is what I like to do is come up with a phrase or maybe it's a line from a song or a line from a book that I or a quote or something like that that I know. And I just do the first letter of each of those. So I can kind of say it in my head and I can write the first letter of each of that, that either song, phrase or, or, or chorus or uh, line or whatever that quote is. Um, and so I don't have to remember you know, a weird set of letters and numbers, but I know that phrase, and by I say it to myself, I just put the first letter of each one. And then I might replace um, one of those letters with a number, if it's a number one or an I or something like that, or, you know, if it's an O, I might put a zero and, and that kind of stuff. And also including some other symbols like hashtag or exclamation point. The other thing that's really important, and I see a lot of people do this as well, is not having the same password for everything. And the reason why is it doesn't matter that, well, I use this one that way. I don't really care about this other website very much. It's not that they will use that to get into, say, your bank password. It's that they'll use another service that's that's not as secure, and that's how they use the same passwords. That's how they break into stuff. It's not that they break in and they crack your password. Is that if you're using the same password everywhere, then – then that's that's how it happens. They can see their email address and copy and paste it. And there's some big players here. Equifax was one um, a couple of years ago. I, actually, I'm not sure um, how long ago that was. It wasn't very long ago um, when the Equifax, where they basically the credit bureau, um, and they're the ones that actually got hacked again, and everybody um, – lost their information because they weren't doing, keeping appropriate amount of security on there. And so if you use the same password there, and this was a very, at the time, reputable company, um, if you were using the, your password on their website, then they would be able to get to everything else from it. So uh, the easiest way to deal with that is we'll talk about passwords managers in a little bit, and that's how I would address that. The other thing you can do here, let me go back to my Google account. So how can I tell if I'm you know, using good passwords or, or all that kind of stuff? In my regular Google account, up here, if I click on my icon, so my actual image up in the upper right here, I can go to manage your Google account. And right over on the left here, it says security. I'm going to click on that. 
So I can go through, if I want to do the steps of securing my account right here, I can go through those steps and it will walk you through, it will tell you information. I have some third party access. I'll explain what that is in a second. How many devices am I signed into? If there's a device that I'm signed into, but I haven't used it for like, you know, three months, maybe it's an old phone that I upgraded and I still, I'm still signing my old phone or whatever that is, I can remotely turn those off. I can click on this and I can say disable or remotely uh, uh, disconnect myself. And that's an easy way to do that. Recent security events. So you see those emails every once in a while, they'll pop up and say, hey, did you just sign into this new Chromebook or did you just sign into this new phone? And if you haven't done so, you'd be like, oh, wait a second, I, I don't recognize that. And that will kind of help you walk through that process. And also two a factor verification. Okay, so I'm gonna actually switch off uh, presenting for a second because this is a, a big one. This is the probably the best advice that I'm gonna give you that you're not gonna take. Okay, so most people recommend when we use a password, that is something that we know. It's a one level of authentication. So if I use my password to get in, I know what that is, type it in, and we're good to go. Two-factor means that it's something that you know and something that you have. So you are trading with all security. You're trading convenience and security. When I would talk to my students and I'd ask them, okay, guys, I want the most secure house that I can live in. And we start talking about what a house, like, well, it's not very secure if I have windows. Okay, no windows. What about the walls? They're only made of wood. Okay, stone walls. Um, and we start going through and eventually get to the point where we realize, the students realize the most secure thing would be to live inside of a prison, <laughs> right? Where if you live inside of a prison, you're locked in, nobody's gonna be able to break in. Uh, not very fun and not very convenient either. So there's a trade-off with convenience of we wanna live our lives, at the same time, what's considered secure. So two-factor authentication is more steps. It's more difficult, uh, but it's way more secure. And what that is is something that you know, your password, and something that you have, your phone. So what happens if I want to sign in, I would sign in with a password, and then a unique code would pop up on an app on my phone, and I would type that in, one, two, three, four, five, or whatever it is, you know, randomized uh, number. And that way, if somebody didn't have my physical device, they wouldn't be able to get into my account as well. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm very commonly have my phone with me, or if you don't use other devices too, you can use another laptop or another machine to do that a process. Um, it's way more secure. Of course, it's a little bit less uh, convenient. So that's the trade-off there. Um, all right, we're gonna jump back into the security checkup. So I, again, to get on here really quickly, if you not, not missed that part of it, I just went to my google.com sign in, click on my name, go down to manage my Google account, and then security over here on the left. Security issues found. Okay. So in my security check, I have this thing, it's, it's orange. What's going on here? Third party access. What that means is anytime you've ever been to a website, let's say, for example, like WeVideo, like we talked about, or Screencastify, or some of these other programs that I've used um, that I said, yes, you sign in with my Google account. Generally speaking, that's fine. That's not an issue, but you just want to be aware of these. I actually write a lot of programs for our district, so I have a lot of these scripts that are very unique. And it looks like it's, it says it's risky. It's because it doesn't recognize it as an official company. It's a, a script that I wrote for our district, things like our, uh, I don't know, all kinds of different stuff. We're working on right now for the for the um, daily hourly thing to be part of this. So that would be a, its own program that I a custom wrote. And that's why it has access, but it, look, it says it thinks it's risky. It's I know that it's really not. But generally speaking, a lot of these, let me find one that's not one that I wrote. Let's keep going here. All right, DocHub, that's a good one. We've been talking about DocHub. So DocHub is that PDF tool that I can write over or, or annotate PDFs and so forth and edit. So this is another program. It's not a Google program. It's not one from the district that is uh, that we created, That excuse me, I didn't create, that we connected with our Google account. And so it's just saying, hey, this has access. Is that OK? And if I wanted to, I could remove access right now. That's that window that pops up and says, hey, do you allow DocHub to access your Google Drive or not? Now, if you recognize the application, and if you know about it, and I can click right here on more information, the little eye, eye here, and it'll say, what things is it allowed to do? Um, this is allowed to do all this kind of stuff. And more about this app, where's the web page, when it was given, all that kind of stuff. It's allowed to manage and send emails. And you might say, well, why would you allow them to send emails? This is that. This is that program that would pop up with a PDF. I could write on it and say, oh, yeah, here's this, here's this, whatever, send. And I could send that as a new item, a new PDF, to you through an email. And that's why. If that's an issue, if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can always just revoke access, and then you're good to go. 
Um, and I have a bunch of these as Cami, uh, Polar Cloud, all this kind of stuff. These are ones that I've said yes to. If you're never sure, if you're like, geez, I don't know if I recognize that one, when in doubt, remove it. And it will ask you again later on if you try to use it and pop up and say, hey, what is this one? Um, and it will just ask you, oh, yeah, I do recognize that one. Now I click allow. If there's one that you don't recognize at all, you might say, you know what? I don't recognize this one. I'm not comfortable with it. I'm going to revoke access. Again, that's up to you. The other thing in the security checkup that we talked about here, let me jump here and scroll down, was uh, the password checkup. So I can click on this. And this will go through and check my actual passwords. Um, now, uh, what that means is if it finds a password that's out there, um, there is a website that you can put your email address called Have I Ben Pwn. So Have I B E N P W N E D. Now, what that is is um, it's a it's a gamer speak is with the poem, but basically you put your email address, and if there's a data breach in the world somewhere, like Equifax or like uh, there's all there's been all kinds of them, you'll get notified. Hey, so and so just got hacked. You may want to change your password for that, um, or you may want to delete your account entirely. And again, that's why I recommend making sure that you have a different password for each account you use. Um, otherwise, that could be problematic if you have the same one for everyone. So you just go through the process, it will check your passwords, it will connect them and say, oh, we recognize this password somewhere else, so you may want to make sure you want to change it. Um, and that will walk you through those steps right there. The other tool that we, we haven't got to yet, but I want to share with you guys, and again, all these things are on that arch19.info site. And if you scroll down on today's show notes, um, you'll see the links to these things right here, the security, um, all the other kind of stuff that you asked. Um, somebody asked about location. So if you're asked about location, if you're asked like, um, you know, I want to showcase, is it okay if I allow my location or not? Again, it depends on your preferences. It also depends on the type of app. So I want you to think about something for a second. There are thousands or probably even more than that of free flashlight apps for smartphones, right? There's, there's tons and tons and tons of them. And I said, why are these all these foolish flashlight apps? Why are there so many of them and they give away for free? What's the value? What they will do is when you install the flashlight app, and again, there's other ones, not just flashlight apps, but when they install it, it will ask you, hey, is it okay if we see your location and your contact list and all this kind of stuff? And a lot of us for a long time would just say, oh, yeah, well, I don't care, whatever. Well, what you're doing is you're basically giving them access to your data. Why is that worthwhile? Your data is extremely valuable. Not you specifically, not you as far as your first name, last name, not that kind of stuff, but your demographic data. And the reason why that's so valuable is because if you are a um, middle-aged man who lives in central Maine who um, likes tech, it drives me, right, um, then, uh, you know, the, then they can actually target ads towards my preferences. And the reason why that's valuable is if I go to Facebook or Google or whatever, say I want to target because uh, I have a tech company in Central Maine, so location. I want to know who's in that area, and I want to target you know ads that based around what these preferences are. That's what that's connected to. That's why that's so valuable. Because otherwise, typical advertising before the internet ad kind of the way that's run now would just kind of scatter shot, just kind of put out there in magazines, broadcast on TV, and hope somebody sees it. Now they can target it right down to like you know less than a dozen people and say okay I want to see people who are you know central Maine uh, white Caucasian male you know middle age uh, who I don't know whatever whatever I can keep coming down to to, to kind of filter just to uh, add advertisements that are just direct address say specifically to me um, and so that's why it's worth their time and energy to put out free apps that you're giving them access to that kind of information uh, and same thing with location now again you can allow or disallow or whatever you know depending on what you want to do what I typically do if it asks me that I'll typically say you can allow while you're using the app and the reason why is if I'm pulled up a maps app or a weather app or something like that I probably want it to know my location but it probably doesn't need to know my location when I'm not using that app specifically so that's what I my default that's what I generally do all right Let me jump back over here a couple other tools that I want to cover um, one was a security checkup, which we talked about. Here's another one. So if you want to do this with students, 
there's a link called um, Interland, I-N-T-E-R-L-A-N-D. And so if you just Google that, it'll pop right up, Explore Interland. And this is going to be for younger kids. I would say K through fifth grade, maybe sixth grade. It's a little bit kiddish for, for sixth graders and even some fifth graders. Um, but this is just a fun game that kids can play. They can walk right through. They can play it right in their browser. And they do things like they talk about sharing and not sharing information online. Um, they talk about you know vetting or information sources. They do it in this kind of fun game format. I've done this with students before. Um, we usually do it as a class because we'll talk about uh, which things are you know appropriate or not. If you'll notice here, let me just mute it. It just has a handful of sound effects. So this one's Reality River. Don't fall for fakes. And it'll ask them questions and they can click on, you know, earn points. And um, it's not huge. The whole thing will probably take them half an hour, maybe 45 minutes to do, depending on your age level. But it's a great place to share. Mindful Mountain. Share with care. So talking about sharing your own information, um, making sure that you're not putting out their personal information you shouldn't be. Securing your secrets. So making sure you're not, again, giving out real, real information to the world or to the public or things you think are secret. And it's cool to be kind, you know, when you are, it addresses bullying a little bit, talks about making sure that you're not, you know, even though you think that online is a little bit different, but we know, you know, very personally, it doesn't have to be. So um, if you get a chance with younger kids, like I said, probably K-4, maybe fifth grade, um, Interland is just a, a fun thing they can play and they can play on their own. So that's for younger kids. For us for us adults and i really highly recommend everybody takes this um it, it takes the whole thing might take five minutes um maybe not much longer than that um basically the idea of can you spot when you're being fished when we talk about fished it's p-h-i-s-h-e-d identifying phishing can be harder than you think phishing is an attempt to trick you into giving up personal information by pretending to be someone you know can you tell what's fake and so what I typically hear from teachers or other people like, oh, I never, you know, email or respond to people that I don't recognize. That's still problematic. If someone compromised my email address, so my Kern Kelly email address, and my address got taken over and, and spammed up everybody that's in my contact list, you would receive an email that it looked like it was from me. Hey, Kern Kelly just asked you, uh, what do you think about this? Click this link. And like, okay, well, it's from current, it must be fine, but you want to be careful. You want to look at this. So this, if you take this quiz and they ask you just for sample information, again, you can just make up anything in here, um, uh, gmail.com. And the reason why I do this is they just want to show you what the emails look like. They're not actually sending that in. But if I get started, here's the first example. We're not going to do all these. I want you to do these on your own if you get a chance. Um, but we'll start with this Google Doc email. Be sure to check the URLs by hovering or long pressing, and you decide if it's phishing or illegitimate. So if I scroll down here, here was the email from Luke Johnson. Uh, details. Uh, Luke Johnson shared a document with the following document, 2020 Department Budget Docs. Hey there, here's the doc you look for. Let me know if you need anything else. Okay, looks, looks legit. Um, if I put my cursor over this, I can, I can see down the bottom left here. I don't know if that's coming through uh, well enough, but you can see this actually came from the link drive-google.com slash luke.johnson. So that looks legit, but if I actually think about it, it's not google.com, it's drive-google.com. So it's from a different website. Somebody's using that to basically trick you. And so I could come up here and say, well, that's a phishing one. And it's say, correct. Show me why. Why was that phishing? If you mouse over or long press, it will show that it's drive.google.com. So it will tell you why. Um, you, why that was one not, not real. So I highly recommend you take that if you haven't a chance. Um, it's just phishingquiz.withgoogle.com. Uh, I'll put that in the chat, but at the same time, as I mentioned, it's right in the show notes. Let me add that. Whoops, I put it twice. Um, so it's kind of fun. Like I said, there's only eight questions. It doesn't take you very long to do, um, but it's worth doing. I think if you get a chance, I would definitely check that out. Um, and these are these are the types of things that you should be looking at all the times when you are doing, um, you know, when you're filling out emails or responding to somebody and that kind of thing. The last one I'm going to share with you, whoops. And this also uh, may fall in a category of things that I know I should do, but I just don't because it's more uh, cumbersome. So. We talked about having different passwords for every website and, and the managing that. Boy, that seems like a lot of work. Or at least having really good passwords. There are different password managers out there. There's probably a dozen. Um, and I'm just going to point you to one. Um, there might be other ones you like better. Um, this is one of the bigger ones. So there's one called LastPass. 
There's other ones called 1Password, and there's even more. But those are the, the kind of the two biggies. Um, so what this does is basically you have a single password, and you want to have a really good one, and it is like a, like a layer between you and all the websites you use for accounts. So it would create these really crazy long 20 character passwords that you would never recognize or, or remember. You don't have to. You just have to remember your one master password. And then it's kind of a layer between you so that if, if I go to Amazon, or if I go to Best Buy or eBay or wherever else I go to for a website, it would put this crazy long password in there for you and kind of manage that process. Now, like I said, it's a little bit to set up and it's a little bit more work initially, um, but it's way more secure because each website, each service, would have a crazy long password of 20 characters or so um, of all kinds of things, letters, numbers, symbols, whatever. They wouldn't mean anything. They're randomly generated, but you would have one master password that you would have to use for getting in there. Now, you can't lose or forget that one master password because if you do, you are unable to get into all the other ones. You need that secure. You have to make sure you remember that and you don't lose that somewhere. Um, and like I said, it is also a little bit more set up initially, uh, but once you have it, you you would have that for good. Um, so again, that might be one of those situations that, you know, it sounds good, um, but, uh, you know, taking the time to do that might be problematic, um, but that, that would be a recommendation. Again, like two-factor. Uh, somebody asked a question, does that work if you're signing in from a phone as a multi-device? Yes, it is cross-platform. It works across everything, basically. It's web-based. Um, you can go through the details. They're end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that that's why if you lost your master password, even the company themselves couldn't go back and get inside of it because it's encrypted to the point where only you with that master password can get into it. So you want to really make sure that you don't lose it. Um, one of the, the biggest tasks that we've had in the tech department these first couple weeks um, getting people online or whatever has been resetting passwords students forget them or they don't remember or whatever or you know people misplace them and that happens no big deal uh, but as we're going forward this is one of those things that you're really going to be have to be responsible for because so much is dependent on it um, it's like losing your car keys uh, if you lose them at some point can't get anywhere. Huh? So as we go forward, um, you making sure you have a really secure password uh, and you're being secure in your practices. Um, so with that, let me jump over to the questions here. Oh, one question that came up today from a couple people actually. So uh, it's great news. I've heard more and more uh, teachers are creating little videos. They're embedding them in the Google Slides, or they're embedding them, you know, or linking them in Google Classroom or whatever. That's fantastic. Using Screencastify or WeVideo or whatever. Um, by default, when you create that video, just like a Google Doc or just like a Google Spreadsheet or Google Slide, it's going to be private. So you need to make that be public. So let me just do a quick screen share here. So if I'm right now, I'm in the, in my account. Whoops, sorry, click back here. So I'm in the account here, uh, the dummy account that we've been using as a placeholder. I'm going to click on this and go to my drive. If I record something with Screencastify or with WeVideo or so forth right here, um, I'm going to search for a video. Click on here. And I'm search for a type. Let's go find videos. Here it is. So here is a recording. I'm going to click in here. Now I can see this, of course, because... Let me get rid of this little deposit. I can see this, of course, because I created it. Um, nobody else would be able to see this unless I share with them, just like it would be a typical you know, Google Doc or that kind of stuff. I can click on this. I can go to Share. And I could say, I want this to be public for the world, or I want this to be limited to only, so this is anybody, or I want this to be limited to just people in RSU19. If I click Advanced here. So who has access to it? The world? or just people inside of RSU19. The benefit of that is that, like, for example, your students would be able to access it. They're signing with their accounts, um, but not necessarily mom and dad, unless they're with their student looking at it. So if I wanted something to be, you know, be able to be shared with everybody, um, I would just click on that. And that way everybody can view it. No big deal, no problem. If I want to share with students in RSU19, they can view it. Um, so for example, we're going to start recording. I know some people have recorded uh, them reading books. And we've been researching this as the tech department, uh, as far as you're reading, recording yourself, reading a book, and, and sharing that like you do a read aloud. It's a little bit uh, gray area as far as legality. The way that I we understand it, and we show you the documentation, is you can record yourself reading for your class because it's an educational component. It's called fair use. 
but you can't publish it to the world like it's a, a new version. And the reason why, where that comes down to really is, are you hurting the author by you know, by publishing that so they can't make you sell that book. And honestly, right now in these situations, it's probably fine. Here's what we're doing to kind of mitigate this is if you're doing a live reading, so right now, if I'm le reading a story live to a bunch of students, they can join me at a certain time. We're publishing that live so kids can just watch and have it. The recording of that, however, we're going to keep it under the RSU19 umbrella. What I mean by that is you'd have to have a district account to be able to see it. And that way we kind of, it, it threads the needle for both ends, meaning that yes, we can have live streams and, and everybody can watch it and enjoy it. But if you are uh, sharing that video afterward, we're not hurting the author because we're having that as part of our assignments, part of our educational offerings. And that way it's inside of a domain. And so that's the difference here, going from a public one versus a inside the RSU19 link. The other thing you can do, and this is what I recommended uh, to the teacher this morning, is I can create a folder right here. If I'm in my Google Drive, uh, create a new folder. I want to call this my public videos. So create that folder. So here it is, my public videos. I'm going to double click on that. So now I can make it so that anything that I drag in here or add to this folder will automatically be public. So I don't have to do it one by one. If I click on this right here, up at the top, a little triangle here. You'll see this uh, Git uh, Share right here. Click on Share. And again, it's the same settings. So I can click Advanced. Right now it's still private. So I'm going to say, well, I'm going to change that from private to public on the web. It means other people can view it. Now, view only. We don't want them to allow them to edit it or organize or whatever. But we're going to keep it view only. Click Save. And you'll even notice if I click Done here, you'll notice here that in a second here, see that little icon? It says that it's shared. It tells you, okay, this is open, by the way, this is shared. So now if I have that document, let's say I have that video I mentioned earlier. So let's see, find it here. Well, we'll just use this one. We'll use this, any of these documents. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a document, slideshow, any of these things. I can drag it into my public videos and boom, it's going to ask me, hey, this is going to be public now. Are you okay? Yeah. So now I don't have to go in and, and do that for every single item. I could just make a public shared folder. Um, that would be that. Okay. All right, let's check real quickly, see if there's any other questions before we wrap it up for the day. Okay, somebody asked about a Zoom meeting and saved it to their drive. Does that cover my responsibilities to the district for security purposes? Um, the way that we understand, as it's written, if you look at FERPA, is that if you have official you know, educational documentation of a meeting or so forth, you have to keep a record of that. Cool. Uh, my question with the Zoom, and again, if you're doing all the steps and it's covered and it's safe and it's great, awesome. Um, but um, let me just share real quickly here. Let me see if I find that link. Um, I might have shut it down here. I'll throw a link in the show notes that tell you all the steps that uh, they, that, that Zoom themselves recommend right here. Let me throw that. I'm going to throw this right in the show notes, and I'll put it right in the chat as well. So these are the steps that Zoom themselves recommends to make sure that you have exactly what you want, that it is totally, um, you know, secure and so forth. So again, my concern with that is it's like a I don't know, eight to ten step process every time. And so if you miss one of those steps, what does that mean? Does that mean somebody else can jump in? Does that mean that it's open? I don't know. Like we got to, you know, make sure that everybody's doing all those steps every time. And so. Um, Make it just make sure if you have to use Zoom for, for a reason, um, then that's what I would do. I would make sure I use those steps. And I'll, like I said, I'll throw those in the show notes as well. All right. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm back full screen here. Um, thank you guys all. This has been a great one. I hopefully, again, security is not always an exciting topic, but it's one of those things that we have to cover, we have to talk about. Um, tomorrow we will be doing Wii Video. Uh, so we'll go through that process. I'll probably record with Screencastify or something and then import it to Wii Video and play with it a little bit to show you how that works. Um, just note, the, the issue with Wii Video is going to be, I can tell you right now, is the rendering time, like if I take a, a video and I render it and save it, um, it just takes a long time because it's all web-based. So what I'll probably end up doing is doing it kind of like uh, a, a cooking show style where I have certain things already done and we'll just kind of jump through the steps of going from like, okay, this is when we started and this is what it looks like when it's done. So we don't have to wait for that process um, to go from one stage to another. Uh, but we'll do a wee video tomorrow uh, and then we're going to do, it looks like, I think Thursday. Um, I have been asked to do a, a full one specifically on Google Hangouts. 
Um, and so that's what we'll do for that. We'll do that basically just, uh, we talked about Google Hangouts off and on, but I'll do one video just about Google Meet and Hangouts and, and, and cover all the steps there. I'm also adding some of the new extensions. They've added new extensions since last time we met um, that are kind of uh, useful to have as far as grid view and raising your hand and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then for Friday, I'm hoping to get a special guest. I have a student that's going to hopefully join us so if that works out. Uh, so we'll see if that works, and we will do that on Friday for story time. So thank you all. Everybody have a great on day, and I will see you guys tomorrow at 1. Bye.